go. Say goodbye. There we go. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Steve Singer, and I'm delighted to be your host for tonight's thought leadership discussion on promoting better education. Tonight, we'll be discussing how and what we can do to promote better methods, policies, and technologies to assist our kids and adults in improving lifelong learning skills. We will have a question and answers during the presentation, so if you'd like to ask questions after our panel members have responded to the questions, please feel free to grab a mic or enter in something in the chat. I'm delighted to have such a distinguished panel and current thought leaders for our discussion. So let me let them introduce themselves. Dean, why don't you start and tell us about yourself, your background and your passion surrounding education and what brings you to tonight's panel? My name is Dean Kamen. I have a day job where I have a company that has about 800 engineers and for decades now we've been designing advanced technologies in mostly in the medical space prosthetic limbs dialysis machines insulin pumps uh, devices to carry disabled people around uh, including keeping them upright and balanced and climbing stairs um, I think I'm really here tonight because of a not-for-profit I founded about 30 years ago called FIRST for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. And it's a program that tries to bring together kids, teachers, parents, mentors, government, basically every stakeholder that is concerned that kids need at an earlier and earlier age these days to embrace the power of science and technology, uh, because most of the exciting jobs and careers in the very near future, it's already happening, uh, will not be available to kids that can't appreciate and understand and, and apply science and technology. So we started this program uh, to inspire kids. That's what the I is in first for inspiration and recognition of science and technology. And I'm happy to tell you that it started out 30 years ago, and I had about 23 teams of kids competing in this sport for the mind. We've had phenomenal compound growth, 23 teams in the first year, about 50 in the second, 100 in the third. This year, we have 81,000 schools. We're in almost wow. every country in the world. And uh, we're very excited that we're convincing kids all over the world just how accessible and fun and rewarding technology can be. And Sandeep, what about yourself? Yeah, good evening, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here on this panel. Uh, my main passion is education. Uh, so we, uh, we am a chairman at ASM Group of Institutions, which is providing education right from kindergarten all the way up to the PhD with a focus on management and IT uh, fields as such. We have more than 7,000 students studying with us full time. And uh, other than that, uh, I do have some foundations and also some startups. Uh, interestingly, I have a 15 year old uh, who has innovated and is on a mission to promote innovation and entrepreneurship in the super young children. And one of the things what uh, I've always been uh, wanting to do is how to improve the quality of education and how to better education because the traditional education systems have their own uh, issues and uh, i think uh, a time has come that we have to reboot reset and also reimagine the education system mm -hmm. uh, so i've been working uh, trying to work a lot in that particular sphere um, uh, and um, Yes, uh, through our foundation, uh, you know, we have been providing um, life skills like crowdfunding, uh, teaching IPR and encouraging students to become innovators and entrepreneurs. So till now, uh, in just uh, under a year, we have trained more than 10,000 students um, across uh, and uh, encouraging them uh, 
to to become entrepreneurs take up social causes and most importantly as my son says is make them think and ask questions that's great from both of you um well let's begin our discussion by asking a thought provoking uh question um the th- current state of teaching children after their formative years and reskilling upskilling adults is broken what are the 21st century skills necessary for today's youth and adults to succeed and what current 2021 technologies should be promoted to achieve these goals you want to go sit and deep on answer trying to th- tackle that okay. question so you say, yes um, you're absolutely right when you say that uh, yes we absolutely need to upskill and reskill not only uh, the youth but also the adults and uh, if you look at what covid has done is you know uh, it has uh, actually told us that yes you need to have those new skills with you uh, if you ask me about the youth I, I i look out 10 15 20 years down the line and see how the world is going to be at that time when they actually come into the real world and that is where i i see that um, we are not preparing them for that particular future uh the the skills uh, the jobs of the future are going to be very different it you know it most of them don't even exist today and that's the challenge with the education system how do you prepare your uh, ch- children to be ready for the jobs of the future which today you don't know even how they are going to be so the skills there which are going to be required are going to be innovation creativity critical thinking problem solving skills Uh, these are the skills which i think we should be imparting to with adults or by or to the children and if they have these skills they would be able to do well uh, in in the uh, coming new world as such and this is where i think uh, the adoption of technology is very important in the education sector thanks to covid i think it has been the biggest driver of adoption of technology in education uh it's it's across the world you could see that changing um i've studied at harvard and all my faculties and deans have told that if they were to tell all the teachers to go online and adopt technology it it wouldn't have happened but covid forced everyone to adopt and go for the technology uh, so I, i believe that uh, the use uh, in the future is going to be blended education where we use uh, the technologies uh, for giving a better teaching learning experience and give options for students to learn what they could not learn in a traditional setting so um, ai ml vr the metaverse is going to be playing a very very important role uh, in uh, reskilling the the youth as well as um, uh, a lot of reskilling and I, i say new skilling is required in the current working population Uh, to keep them uh, relevant to the jobs which are uh, and the tasks which are coming to them but uh, what is most important is how to drive that uh, innovation and entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship also uh, in in the in the young workforce as well as uh, the the working professionals because i think these skills can be driven if they have that entrepreneurial mindset so driving entrepreneurial mindset innovation and to get those skills uh, of uh, critical thinking problem solving is the key i think for the future and dean what about yourself what do you think i would agree with everything you just heard i think schools historically have been a place that imparts facts to students textbooks are full of facts uh kids are lined up in rows and you open up their head and you pour the facts in and then you test them by seeing whether they can open up their mouth and regurgitate the facts back and that probably made sense as a basis of quote learning a long time ago but now that everybody is walking around with all the facts the world has ever created that they can instantly access uh from a device they're carrying the marginal value of having them in your head is small in fact i think it's negative it's a distraction and schools have to stop working at turning kids into a repository of facts they need to give them 
instead the skills to apply those facts uh, to create new and different things. As Sandeep said, you know, they need to learn to be creative, to be entrepreneurial, to be innovative. And I think while that's important to do, it's hard to do it in a structured classroom setting, which is why I started my first robotics competition where kids are given piles of things in an open-ended set of uh, tasks for which there isn't a clear set of right answers in the back of the book. Instead, the kids are encouraged to learn what they need to know, get facts which are easily accessible on the internet and try to apply them in creative, new and different ways uh, and when you come to our competitions, you see that instead of all the kids trying to optimize to the right answer, the one in the back of a book, the one that you can get a test, instead you see an enormous number of different outcomes that are really uh, created because these kids, hopefully working with, with mentors and teachers, uh, what they're really learning is how to deal with complex sets of problems and trying to come up with uh, unique answers uh, that hopefully are are a better solution to that problem than the person sitting next to them. So it's a fun, we call it a cooperation because they're, they're robots, their solutions don't defeat the other ones. They just compete with them to see you know, who can come up with the most effective, most creative way uh, to attack a given problem. And I think what FIRST does by giving kids project-based uh, learning opportunities is it gives them really a glimpse into what the real world of engineering is like. The kits we give them uh, don't have enough parts. We don't give them enough time. They don't know what the competitors are going to do. They have to ship a product that they built and debug, and it has to work. And in the real world of engineering, you never have enough time. You never have enough resources. You never know what your competitors are doing, and you have to create something that works. So taking them out of a classroom, giving them real world, exciting ways to, to challenge themselves and each other uh, gives them a taste uh, of what the real world of engineering is. And to your point before, uh, it will make them way more adaptable to a world of ever changing base technologies that are advancing every year and give them a credible way to understand how they have to be perpetually learning and upgrading uh, their skill sets. Indeed, it also sounds to me that, you know, what you're talking about in terms of project base is it's multidisciplinary. So they get to learn about a lot of different dis disciplines while they're doing it. And maybe more importantly is it looks like they, they've also got team building going on and, and how the importance of team in both of what you, what both of you are saying. I think teamwork, uh, we've justified it for decades uh, when we give schools such expensive distractions as the football team and the basketball team and the soccer team. And we wonder why is that part of, quote, education? And the underlying uh, justification for that is they have to learn teamwork, which is a critical life skill that you typically don't get in the classroom, because if you do teamwork in the classroom, it's called cheating. So we, we create a, a program, a competition where all the important stuff in math and science and engineering and, you know, the stuff that, that they really are exposed to in a classroom comes alive as a team sport. It's the best of all worlds. The kids develop a passion. Uh, they yet still have to uh, learn how to effectively become a team member in order to succeed. So, yeah, teamwork is critical in life and in first, and it should be part of uh, education. So Sandeep, how do you teach that in, in your, you know, in your arena, you know, in terms of like emphasizing that people have strengths mm -hmm. and you should really emphasize their strengths in terms of, instead of like looking at people's weaknesses? Uh, yes, uh, you're right. Uh, uh, I, I know I totally agree with Dean, uh, what he said. Um, I think it is very important to let the kids, uh, you know, work in teams. And unfortunately, that's what our education system does not do. You know, when we talk of 21st century skills, they cannot be taught in a traditional way. 
it has to be uh, taught in a gamified experimental project based kind of uh, learning and uh, that is where the the projects and uh, the internships and other things will be come into the play uh, like dean is doing those competitions you know we have been doing similar things uh, in india and we found that those are the things what really students enjoy and that is where they can put the learnings into practice uh, i've 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 been a student of engineering in india and unfortunately when the software companies want us to work in teams the the internships in the university say no you have to do it alone you cannot work in a team <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you're made to write big reports whereas the industry would require to say okay just say it in a minute <laughs> you know we, we we don't want your long reports or <laughs> whatever as such so that disconnect is there and i believe that disconnect is coming because of our assessment systems we need to really reimagine the whole education system we need to look at changing the way we are assessing the students and if that comes in only then we'll be able to bring that change because you know when you talk of the strengths uh, i think what edtech companies should be doing is to not convert the physical classroom into the online world because you're you're bringing the same problems in there but what should be done is to totally reimagine the content reimagine the delivery uh using the strengths of the online and um, you know if if we use that you know that's where that anytime anywhere any language kind of thing we could provide and another thing what i really feel is um the basic problem with the education system is you're putting students of the same age together and not of the same intellect mm-hmm. uh, and uh, some may learn a subject quicker some may learn a subject slowly and uh, this is where project based learning or you know competitions taking part is where you could work in teams not of the same age also <laughs> and mm-hmm. that i think interaction is very very critical and important Well that's great Cindy because it kind of leads into our next question here which is how how should content and delivery systems be reimagined that promote entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship within the public private and industrial education systems so Dean you want to tackle that mouthful there so again i guess if i knew that would be a specific question i wouldn't have spoken so much uh, to the last one because it would be redundant now but what i would tell you is i think the entire structure of first is exactly uh, the solution to the problem of um giving kids the the interest in in innovation and entrepreneurial and, and as we talked uh team based uh learning that's that's relevant um and it is a microcosm of, of the real world we worked hard to make the competition uh a way to introduce uh kids to the ongoing process of of learning and every year uh the kits change the challenges change the resources and technology we put uh, in front of these kids changes um and i think uh the teams have to figure out how to succeed by for instance even including raising money to come to competition so they typically have a marketing group uh Uh, they have a, a whole infrastructure of management that they have to put together to be effective so they're learning all the skill sets you need to be a successful entrepreneur or innovator again uh, that's not what you get in a classroom and i think project based experiential uh, opportunities uh, need to be uh, part of even very young kids uh, education what about adults though you know that we because ai is coming on that we need to reeducate them and rethink about what role they're going to uh they're going to play in our society and how they're going to come out ahead and the whole society comes out ahead so how do we reimagine you know promoting these in, in those in the adults too and during this lifelong learning process so they don't get freaked out when you know the technology overtakes them and they don't know how to respond as most of the younger people that i observe can adopt it a lot more readily than they can sending so, okay uh yes even yes you're so right uh, you've always seen that the younger generation adapts to the technology more quickly 
uh, and uh, they they are ahead of the curve in in those. You know, if, if you see grandparents, you know, going to their grandchildren to learn how to use the technology, or you know, the, they are the ones who who teach the adults. And in fact, uh, uh, most of the technology buying decisions in the homes are also uh, you know uh, influenced by the kids nowadays. <laughs> Uh, so yes, uh, you, you're right when you say that. But uh, the main important thing here is that um, in in today's world, you have to continuously reskill, new skill, and upskill yourself. And for adults, it's very important to unlearn also <laughs> most of the things, which is a very difficult thing. I think that's that's the mindset change which is required. Uh, you need to continuously be doing that. And uh, I think uh, if you look at the ed tech or the online world, it's a it's a very nice tool for reskilling experienced adults. <laughs> uh, so uh, we found when we talk of executive education, it works much much more better and more effectively uh, than compared to uh, uh, teaching young uh, kids uh, as such. <laughs> so if we adopt the online methods well. And uh, provide these uh, project-based gamified kind of systems, even to adults. I think that's going to be a very good way to reskill, upskill them, and keep them relevant. Because if they don't do that, they won't be relevant even, and may not be even required in their current companies. So, how, how do you bridge? How do you bridge the? To me, so you know, you got you got uh, somebody who's coming out of college, and they don't have the uh, the industry experience. You know, how does industry kind of fit into this picture of doing these delivery systems and what the content is and things like that? Dean, you've touched on it a lot because I know in your uh, in, in the robotic competition that you're you have huge amounts of industry that are part of figuring out what the content is. And they're on the board uh, and they also are teaching that stuff. Uh, so I'd like to get you know your thoughts on on some of that that uh, that stuff. Do you mean spe- specifically how you impart those new skills to people after they leave school? What what is the exact uh, uh, question? The, the question is is that how do you get industry involved in terms of the curriculum so that when they're coming out, that industry wants them to be part of whatever their company is going to be. Uh, and vice versa. So there, there is this, this, this uh, co, uh, I call it co-parenting, to tell you honestly, in terms of whatever that, you know, in that. So I think the probably the most unique thing about the first program is what we call the the mentorship aspect. The teacher for every team is is the coach that makes sure the kids are safe and there and participating and organizing it. But we always ask every team to get an outside mentor or group of mentors from a corporate uh, entity in their community because those mentors are the people that deal with the whatever is the current issues in technology. And they're, to, they're there to show the kids what, what they're looking for and how to apply the technologies uh, that are relevant to whatever that, that corporate uh, mentor does. But we have 3,700 corporate sponsors. Many of them have thousands of internal uh, engineers in their company. We have over 200,000 registered professionals as mentors for our teams. So every team has at least one or two. And to exactly uh, meet the question you have there, we think one of the most critical aspects of, of the first competition is that it brings together the education side, the teachers and the students, to the corporate and and business side, which is let's look at the real problems and how they're really addressed with the tools that are really the the current standard in industry, and it and it works. That's great. Go ahead, Sandeep. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we we have been uh, trying to work a lot with the industry because uh, the problem what we always talk about is the gap between what the education is providing and what the industry requires. And uh, in a way to fulfill this gap, uh, you know, uh, we've designed a methodology called the Excellence Driven Guaranteed Employability Program. And to that, what we started doing was uh, we are not just working with the industry. 
But uh, what we started doing is co-designing, co-creating, co-delivering, and co-certifying courses with the industry. So we, we did a reverse competency mapping. For example, with Amazon, we've launched a first uh, course in India on emerging tech. And what we did here was uh, understand the gaps what are the skill sets required currently by industry, by Amazon and its system integrators, what kind of people they don't get, and what is the skill sets they require for that. And then designing a curriculum in association with Amazon and co-delivering it, co-creating it, as I think that is what works very well. Uh, so we've been working with IBM, we've been working with Microsoft, we are working with Automation Anywhere, uh, and uh, we are we are not an engineering school. We are a management school, but we are marrying the technology and management together because I believe so, that. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, because uh, both have to be together. You know, you, you cannot work in today's world without each other. But yes, if we work with the industry to develop the curriculum and involve them from that stages. And uh, we're, we're giving the right internships to the students. Uh, we're setting up centers of excellence. Uh, for example, you know, the new th things like phones. Uh, there is nothing available there. But we've got a few startups who are coming to us and saying, we will set up a center of excellence in drone technology at your institution, <laughs> where they will provide the projects to the students. They would provide the trainings and internships. So the industry uh, will get a pool of ready professionals uh, with the skills required for that technology as such. So Sandeep, uh, you know, I think our audience would like to hear about what type of skills that you're seeing from like IBM, what are they asking for? Uh, you know, uh, can you give us some idea about that? Uh, yes. Uh, see, uh, if, if you look at the skills, um, data analytics, I think data is going to be a very important skill. Almost everyone is telling that. Yes, we need students who understand, who can interpret present uh, data as such and analyze data. So data analytics is pretty much on the top of the agenda, uh, as well as skills, like I said, uh, AI, ML, uh, cloud. You know, they should have knowledge of cloud computing. Uh, that, that also definitely helps. And even automation now. Uh, they should understand how to automate the processes uh, as such. Uh, interestingly, we are teaching our HR students that uh, how you manage uh, today your managers for the human resource. Tomorrow, you're going to be requiring bot managers who are going to be managing the bots in the companies. <laughs> and uh, probably, I think uh, most of our students are going to be working in companies where they'll coexist with uh, robots or machines. And uh, you have to... Uh, you know, learn to co work and exist and co work with them together as such. <laughs> you know, with all the technology that's come, kind of coming around that you just mentioned, the, the issue is, is what kind of soft skills that they're going to need in order to interface in with the human factor who are kind of like at the board level making decisions and things like that. Dean, you want to talk about that, uh, those type of skills? Again, I think you don't develop those skin, skills sitting in a typical classroom, which is, you know, a couple of hundred year old model. Um, I think you develop soft skills of how to deal with people and understand people um, by being on, on teams and being in sometimes very uh, complex, uh, high stress situations. You're competing. Uh, again, that's how we've justified sports, and I think it's a valid justification. But uh, the first teams get every bit of that level of uh, anxiety and pressure and excitement, and they learn the soft skills. They're also working with, uh, typically, there's a couple of generations out there. They're young kids. There are teachers. There are mentors, many of whom are very senior professionals from industry. Um, so, uh, I think learning soft skills requires a lot of human interaction, not sitting in a classroom in rows, uh, uh, sucking up uh, data and facts out of textbooks and regurgitating it. How do you um, uh, how do you instill with them the passion? You know, get their passions out. So, you know, that's the best type to me of that I see with our employees. If I can bring out their passions, they're more willing to open up, listen and do that. So how, how do you, both of you, uh, see that happening? 
So even look at the name of our organization first. I've never seen kids running around at a sporting event cheering. I want to be second. Um, we called it first also because it's an acronym. But if you want to know how they develop passion, look what our name is. For the inspiration and recognition of science and technology. And we believe if you can inspire kids the way, frankly, sports does, mm-hmm. uh, to be uh, a superstar, if you can inspire them by showing them examples of people that are just incredibly good at something and they aspire to have the skill set and capability of those role models, uh, that's the goal. But I think you're entirely right. Uh, creating a passion is probably the most critical piece of giving anybody a genuine education. Uh, I think there, you know, a very famous poet said, education is not filling a pail, it is lighting a fire. And I think uh, that's what we need to do. That's a great, great uh, response there, Dean. Sandeep, do you have any other thoughts too? Uh, yes. Uh, see, I, I, you know, uh, during COVID, when we started uh, doing programs for uh, different children, we found that they are very passionate. Uh, all, all we require is to give them a right platform, uh, a right ecosystem, and if if we can give them, uh, you know, a, a platform which can give a voice to their thoughts, uh, they they do, uh, f- you know, uh, are passionate about loads of things. The younger generation wants to make the world a better place. They want to be part of something good. Uh, so that I think is definitely there. But we just need to give them a direction. Now, uh, one of our foundations we have is Next Gen Innovate. And that, that exactly what, what it is about is making the next generation uh, become innovators. And one of the ways we are doing that is um, celebrating uh, the other kids uh, who have done some innovations, who have become entrepreneurs, uh, and uh, using them to inspire other kids that, yes, see, these are the kids who have done it and you can do it as well. I know I, I believe every child has the ability to do extraordinary things. But all we need to do is inspire them. Uh, and if, if uh, again, if you give them a project which is related to something which uh, uh, I think they have a concern to, they would, they would definitely have see that passion come out very quickly from them. And many of the younger generations believe a lot in that. Many of their buying decisions are based on, on these things, uh, whether the company uh, is doing things which are related to the environment, for example, uh, we did some courses to promote the SDGs to the students. And um, the moment they understand the bigger picture, we can immediately see the passion flowing in and the willingness to come in. That's great. Two great responses on passion. I really love it, especially with children. That's really great. Um, so after we do all that, how do we fund, you know, our, our uh, fund and skill our teachers so they can meet the needs to achieve, you know, the current and lifelong educational things that we were talking about? Who wants to go first in terms of that one? I can jump in right away because okay. that's that's exactly what we did in COVID. I told you uh, I had a kid, uh, my son, who, ha- who came up with a project which can help prevent the spread of COVID virus. And the question was, you know, if it's a social venture, how do you fund it? <laughs> and uh, again, a very interesting solution came up is crowdfunding. So what, what we went about doing was um, we trained about 2,000 students from 135 uh, schools, uh, free of cost, in, in the crowdfunding skills, partnered with a crowdfunding uh, company. And through that, um, we, you know, they have raised 27 lakh rupees. In, in, in India, I'm talking about seven year graders to uh, 11 grader students. Mm-hmm. And again, what, what we found is most of these students then came back to us saying that, you know, thank you. You have taught us the skills. We wanted to do a project. I wanted to come up with an album or, you know, this uh, my maid whom I wanted to help. But now I see that funding is not a problem. We, we just set up campaigns of crowdfunding. And we get help from people whom we don't know also. <laughs> so many of them have managed to come up with, uh, you know, funds for their projects, maybe their books, maybe even some music albums. Uh, so, yes, that's one of the ways. And I see now a lot of um, support coming from government as well as industry associations. 
uh, in the, for example, when we talk of teachers training, uh, a lot of courses are coming online. Uh, many of the tech companies uh, in COVID opened up uh, all their courses to our faculty members uh, for free of cost as such. Uh, and uh, now even the government is laying emphasis that it is necessary that you keep on upskilling yourself uh, by compulsorily doing some of these programs. But uh, I think the funding more would be required in the research and development in the education side. Uh, that's where um, uh, even, say, developing countries, India has a long way to go. It's much better in the West. But uh, if industries and institutes can collaborate to set up mm -hmm. not only centers of excellence, but R&D centers <laughs> and fund those, that's where I think the real uh, development of the skills of the teachers will come. <laughs> Yeah. Before I go on to, to Dean's response, I just want to uh, give you some life experience. I was teaching a class yesterday, and one of the things that was coming up with crowdfunding, and that was one of the ways that the uh, the kids were thinking about how to finance their projects and their companies. Uh, but you know, one of the uh, one of the our discussions, what came out of it is that even if you use crowdfunding, the kids have to come up with a product and they have to deliver the product. That's really, to me, the issue with crowdfunding. It's not just a way to, to raise the, uh, raise money, but, you know, it gives them some purpose that it's an ethical purpose of you raise the money. Now you have shareholders, you have stakeholders. You've got to kind of come back to those stakeholders and get the product and doing it. So, Dean, what are your thoughts? So one of the great things I think about, again, first is the funding um, we, of course, teachers need to get good salaries, and I'm glad to see that governments at all levels now are starting to recognize the importance of good teaching and hopefully will start rewarding it uh, more uh, effectively than we have in the past. But first, back to the other question you had is about passion, and it's not just instilling passion in the kids. Um, it's the passion of our mentors. We have, as I said, 200,000 of them, and virtually every single one of them is a volunteer. We don't pay our mentors anything. You can't buy passion. And what you can do is create an environment where world-class technologists uh, are investing their time and their heart and their soul in giving kids the inspiration they need to work hard to develop that muscle hanging between their ears. And the what we do when we create each competition is we really work as hard at making it fun and exciting and challenging for the mentors as we do for the kids because our program depends on that, that huge commitment by, by the mentors. So the answer to your question, how do you fund it? I would say that may not be the exactly right question because funding is not really the major issue. The major issue is find people uh, that are, are getting more out of it than a buck and they're putting more into it than you'd expect somebody uh, that needs to be funded. You have to create an environment where people will invest their time and their energy because they have uh, the long view. They need kids in the next generation to be equipped to uh, to inherit uh, this world full of its problems and do a better job of solving them than we did. Indeed, and very well put. And also, I think that in your program, it sounds like you're also teaching them to be mentors to other people. So that's also passing on the torch to the next generation that the responsibility also lies on their shoulders to do that, too. So Absolutely. Be well put. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to go to another question, which is what government or industry educational policies have you observed or could suggest that uh, that are successful in creating and achieving educational goals? So uh, uh, I, I think that's where uh, the current Indian government has done a fantastic job. We have just recently come up with a new education policy, a national education policy after almost a gap of 35 years. And this is the first time we see a policy which looks at education holistically right from the kindergarten till the higher education. 
it, uh, in, a, in a complete whole sense. And what it has done is uh, it has allowed the freedom to institutions to get in multidisciplinary uh, kind of uh, the education system. So it's multidisciplinary, it's multiple entry, multiple exits are available. It's available in multiple languages now. Uh, so, for example, when we are talking of promoting entrepreneurship, uh, a student could start a course, take a gap, work with this company or do an internship with the company for a year, come back after a year, continue the education. And, and once he gets, um, they have developed something called as an ABC, uh, uh, Academic Bank of Credit. So you get your degree or certificate once you complete that required prerequisites. And it's, it's not going to be in a linear, continuous fashion as the traditional education was. I don't know how it's going to be implemented. It's going to be a very interesting phase to see that. But yes, uh, at least in terms of the policies of the government, they see that they have to promote entrepreneurship. They have to promote innovation. Uh, they're trying to include that in the curriculums. I don't know how well that's going to succeed. Because as I said, unfortunately, uh, you cannot teach 21st uh, first century skills in a traditional way. Otherwise, they are going to land up making it a theoretical subject <laughs> and teaching it in a theoretical way, which actually will go against the principles of innovation as such. But um, I think the uh, will of the government is there, at least in India, I see that. Uh, they see the bigger picture and uh, they are trying to get in policies, which is probably disrupting the traditional education in a way. But uh, yes, uh, with new education policy, uh, it will provide a good ecosystem for the right educators to come in and provide education in the way it should be really provided. Dean, what are your thoughts? You might, you might have asked a question that I'm not sure I have any, any real competence to answer. Um, how does big, complex government uh, at the federal level and the and the smaller but even more complex and politically driven government at the state level and finally the the school board and the spending at the town level how do you get them to effectively uh, do the right things put in the right measures adopt what works uh, improve what doesn't i don't know how you do that the reason I started first as an after-school extracurricular activity is I'd rather uh, work with something I know and understand uh, than try to affect, you know, policies that in some cases may be entrenched and 100 years old. I, I don't know how to answer that question. I think maybe, you know, if we look at it, that industry is driving a little bit of whatever we're talking about because they're the ones that are requiring the degrees. They're the ones that are requiring four years, six years, eight years. So if we start to break down those particular barriers uh, in terms of getting our uh, getting them to accept different degrees or different skill sets, like Sandeep is saying, maybe we can start on that path down bound, uh, uh, what, what Sandeep is talking about of uh, skilling more of our our youth still more of our adults so that the um, industry can employ them and they, they can feel more productive, more, uh, you know, in their own lives in order to do that. You know, I, I think that um, a lot of times we're hearing things about going to two year schools and getting free schools and the whole bit like that. But I kind of look at it going, you can't do that unless there's some kind of path in which they get jobs going forward. So even if you give them schooling and you give them all the, the necessary tools, it's hard for them unless the employers recognize what the, you know, the, the other people are, you know, what their skill sets are so they can employ them in what they want to do in terms of doing that. Any thoughts? Again, I think it's, it is certainly critical to get industry and education aligned it's more important than ever because industry is changing so quickly that if education doesn't learn to be way more adaptive than it has historically been uh, education into classroom level will become less and less relevant and kids are smart enough to know that so they 
They won't pay a lot of attention. They don't really care. And we're already seeing some of that. There are a lot of companies now that really don't care what your grades were or even whether you graduated. They care what your skill sets and capabilities are. And the universities, many of them now don't even ask kids uh, to take the, you know, the SATs. They're really interested uh, in what these kids can do, not well, not how well they can uh, do on a pre-programmed, studyable uh, uh, set of uh, multiple choice questions. So uh, I, I think industry needs to have a louder voice and a closer connection to education. That's great. So our time actually has been flying by here. And uh, I was wondering if anybody has some final thoughts. Yes, I think all of us, sorry, Dean, you could go first. (laughs) I will just say that education is probably the most important thing uh, that the current, the current generation of adults, serious adults ought to be thinking about. Um, as, as I think it was President Roosevelt said, when the world was clearly in the midst of destroying itself, and, and you look at Ukraine these days, I hope this isn't the sequel, but in the middle of World War II, um, President Roosevelt said, it is clear that we will not be able to create the future for our children. We better create our children for the future. And I think that true, that statement is more true now than ever. Well, thank you, Dean. And Sandeep? Uh, yes, uh, now I'll just go to the quote what Obama had said that education and innovation are critical for the development of a, of a society. But however, you know, we've been talking about that innovation in education is really the key to bring about uh, that change in 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 the society as such. So I think uh, we should to get better, to promote better education. We need to innovate. We need to rethink, reboot and reimagine the education system to adapt to the 21st century needs. That's great. Well, I'd like to thank our panel members uh, and the audience for participating. We look forward to seeing you at the future events and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. And Dean, uh, we would, I would love to be a part of your first program.